apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The reason I bring that up in particular is because that is the way that many pastors begin their sermons. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. When I first got out of the seminary, that's how I began all of my sermons. And I'm not wrong or bad, of course, you use the word of God. It's not wrong or bad. But then I started to think. Is there something else that I can do? Something that teaches, but doesn't take away from the Word of God. Because from the very beginning of the sermon, you need to hear the Gospel. Grace, mercy, and peace is yours through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. And so I would say it, but oftentimes I would say it in such a way that kind of was a hurry up to get to the sermon. Kind of flipping. Grace, mercy, peace be to you, yada, yada, yada. Right? That's not what you want to do with the Word of God. And so I would get through it as fast as possible. Grace, mercy, peace be to you from God our Father. And when I was in homiletics class, uh, sermon class, I said that, that, almost that fast. And my professor stopped me. And he said, do it again. And I thought, okay. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Do it again. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Do it again. You sound like a robot. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Good. You can sit down. I haven't even preached a sermon. I spent a week writing that thing. And he said, good, sit down. I didn't even get to preach a sermon. And I was mad. I was mad. I worked hard on that sermon. I should get to preach it. Then when I sit down, actually, to be honest, days later, <laughs> I started thinking about that, and I was like, wow, that sermon really was all about me, wasn't it? That hurt. Because I was forced to say that my words were more important than the words of God. And so when I got out of seminary, and I was in my first parish, I would say, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And then, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be righteous in my sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Let it not be about me. Let me be as the chasuble, not to adorn the man, but to hide from it. That Gavin would be swallowed up by the office and only the word of God would speak. Well, then when I started thinking about it, I didn't take it away because I wanted to prove my homiletics professor wrong, but I started thinking a sermon is very much uh, a travel. It's a journey from beginning to end. It's the journey of every single Christian. And I'll prove it to you. Are there any baptized children with us? You should all have your hands up, by the way. <laughs> Could you please bring the little ones forward?
why I begin my sermon the way that I do. Not that grace, mercy, and peace isn't for them. And quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is for them. However, as I said, the sermon is very much a journey. And so I begin it instead in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Because here's where their journey begins. In the waters of Holy Baptism. And so I begin every sermon. That's right, son. I begin every sermon with those words because they remark the waters of holy baptism onto your head. And then the law is applied. And it cuts you to the quick. And then the gospel is given. And then at the very end, that is the end of your journey, the end of the sermon, and the end of your lives, a blessing is given that you would go on your way in peace and in the promise of the resurrection. The peace of God which surpasses all human understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and forever. Amen. Those words are a blessing, a baptismal blessing, and the truth that no matter where you go, you cannot take off the mark of Christ, right? Right? <laughs> yes, yeah, right. That's right. She's looking at mommy and daddy like, when we take it home. <laughs> and so this is truly, it is. But it's not just a journey for these little ones. And that's the thing. Baptism is not child's play. It's not child's play. Baptism is a sacrament that saves your soul through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. And so when Scripture tells us that if anyone would harm them, may a millstone be, uh, be tied around your neck and that you will be tossed into the sea. Scary Jesus again. But here's the reality. If anyone would hurt one of these, you would deserve much worse. Because for these little ones, you got to answer to me. Because I take these little ones uh, as my personal sheep as well as you. But understand this, unless you have faith like one of these, you shall never enter the kingdom of God. And what is faith such as these? Unflinching belief. Unflinching belief. None of these children deny the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So who do you think you are to do so? In holy baptism, a gift is given unto you, and a mark is carved into your head. And so it is with these little ones. And we have so many people here, and we give thanks for Lois, who, who spent 40 years of fidelity to teach these little ones. And many people who want to continue to teach these little ones. But we also have to vouchsafe and promise that we will not let these little ones fall away. No matter what. And our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has given them the birth, the rebirth in the waters of holy baptism. For those sheep, hear my voice. Right, Oliver? Mm -hmm. And so when we look at these little ones, we know of the true work that Christ does for us. And that true work is this. Nothing more or less than the salvation that was won for us on the cross at Calvary. Yeah, okay. And 
And so when, when we grow up, we all know that Lutherans have baggage. And we gather baggage. But do you remember when salvation was so simple? No, you don't. Because I was never up to you in the first place. Yeah, we go back. Every time one of these little ones passes the font, the little ones pass salvation. Every time you pass this font, you pass your salvation. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would not have you die a wretch, but rather would rejoice in your repentance for the forgiveness of your sins. Even for you little ones who are too cool to come up, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ loves you too. Our Lord poured His, he poured his blood out for the sake of you. And so, when we look at our text, our gospel text for this Sunday, we see that journey. We see that progression. In other words, Christ says to the, tempta to the disciples, temptations to si sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. That's not a metaphor. That's not a word of phrase. It's a reality. You are not to lead little ones astray and you are not to be led astray. I wish, I wish I had the faith of my son. Before the world begins to chip it away and whisper into your ear, did God really say? <laughs> to love unflinchingly, unflinchingly. To believe in Christ unwaveringly. That is a gift that only God can give. And so as you doubt or you question, God reminds you, burning in your flesh with water and the Word, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. And so no matter how far we try to run, no matter how far, hard we try to fight against Him, know this, He sees you by the mark on your forehead. Engraved in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so I refuse, refuse to believe that one of these children can be, uh, can be without the age of accountability. I refuse it because of this reason. These little ones can sin then they can be saved. This is the word of the Lord. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And what happens is a sacramental seal that is given unto God. A child given to God as a sacrifice. A living sacrifice. That when God looks at that baptismal font, He doesn't see little Abelie. He sees Christ right here on the crucifix of your forehead. Her forehead in this, in this situation. On your forehead, God looks at you and He sees the corpus on the cross marked on your forehead. There is nothing more beautiful than that. And it's a gift that's given to, uh, to our children and often squandered on adults. I know that I'm preaching to the crowd, but when God gives you pearls, you don't cast them away. You believe, teach, and confess them. Lutherans have a rich and beautiful doctrine. We're just not very good at telling people about it. And at the pinnacle of our 
apologetics or faith, our doctrine, is this. I am baptized into Christ. Satan, hear this proclamation. I am baptized into Christ. Drop your ugly accusation. I am not so soon enticed. We believe this to be true. And here's the beautiful, one of the most beautiful things about holy baptism is when you have that mark on your head, Satan must fear you. Satan fears you in that mark. It's like this. Some of you, you know that I have an older brother. And my older brother very much uh, applied the life lesson of, I can pick on him, but you can't. And so as much as he tortured me, I many times stood in front of bullies like this. Not never knowing my brother was behind me like this. <laughs> you can stand as a big man when you don't know there's a bigger man behind you. And that's what we do in baptism. We stand like this. Have at it, Satan. You can take my life, my wife, my children, my family, my friends. You can take it all. But there's one thing that you can't take. My salvation and theirs. So have at it. Do your worst. To hell with you, Satan. Do your worst. Because I've got a guy who lived, died, and rose for me. And he is not mere, uh, he is not only man, but is God and man. And he has marked me with his own mark. And so, while we may suffer in this life, and we will, there's rest in the tomb. Because you have been marked. Children have been marked in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, may the peace which surpasses all human understanding Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen.